Hello, welcome everyone to Cree's webinar on heart valve disease. My name is Leah Hines, thank you Annie, and I'm a journalist, author and podcast host and I'm going to be your MC for this evening. This week in Ireland is International Heart Valve Disease Awareness Week. The campaign is led by Global Heart Hub, an alliance of heart patient organisations including Cree, in Ireland and several more organisations and countries across the globe, including the UK, Spain, Italy, Germany and Canada. I'm delighted to be hosting today's important panel discussion. Heart valve disease has been described as the next cardiac epidemic, with statistics showing that one in eight people over the age of 75 are thought to suffer from moderate to severe heart valve disease, which can lead to premature death if left untreated. Early detection and timely treatment of heart valve disease are critical, which is why we're here today. We have over 250 people registered for this event, so you're not alone in wanting to know more about this area, and I hope that we can answer your questions today. I'm delighted to welcome uh, today's expert panel members, Dr. Samir Anous, an interventional cardiologist who specialises in treating heart valve disease, and James Penny, Dr. Arnus's patient from County Limerick, who had a transcatheter aortic valve implantation, known as a TAVI procedure, in January 2021. Thank you both for joining us this evening, and all of you across Ireland who've logged in today. The questions are coming in already, so I'm going to try and do my best to bring them all to our panel for discussion. We also have the Cree Health team in the background too, who will be responding to some of the questions directly through the Q&A section. Now we'd like to hear from our panellists. Dr. Anous, James, welcome to both of you and thank you for joining us. To start, Dr. Anous, I wonder if you could give us a short overview on what exactly heart valve disease is. Thanks very much, Leah. So uh, heart valve disease is a broad term that's given uh, to a number of conditions that affect the heart valve. So we, uh, we have four valves in our heart, um, which regulate uh, blood flow. Um, so uh, it allows flow to, blood to flow from one part of the heart to another part and stops it from going uh, back into the wrong direction. And over time, due to a number of, co of reasons, uh, the valve, very much like a valve in a, in a car, uh, can become faulty. Uh, so it can narrow over time, and if that happens, uh, blood is, doesn't flow efficiently through the valve, or it can leak back, and therefore some blood might leak back in the direction where it shouldn't go. Uh, so it's a general term that's given to any problem with one of the four valves that we all have. Thank you, Dr. Anus. We'll come back to you. We might move to Jim, your patient, first of all now. Um, Jim, you might tell me, if you wouldn't mind, um, some of the symptoms that you experienced which transpired to be heart valve disease. When you first realized something was wrong and why what was going on they they came on me rather gradually first of all i i was it was uh, it was said that i was a breath breathless i didn't really notice it myself <laughs> but a few other people mentioned it to me that i seemed to be breathless but then after another month or two i found that after walking any maybe three four hundred meters i started to get pains across my shoulders Okay. So again, I just thought that I was uh, I was unfit because I hadn't been that active prior to the prior to this, um, and then I found it difficult to sleep at night to lie down sleeping. It was very very difficult, and then I started my my legs started to swell. Mm -hmm. uh, so I am a, a renal patient. I've been a renal patient for the last ten years. Mm -hmm. So I approached my doctor, Doctor uh, Liam Casserly, in the regional, and he admitted me. And he introduced me to Dr. Arnous. And Dr. Arnous uh, decided that I should have an angiogram, which I had. And he diagnosed then that I had uh, my AR to valve problem. Okay. And Jim, if you don't mind me asking, you were in your mid 70s at this point. I, I was 74 at the time, 75 70. now. Okay. So once you were diagnosed, you might talk us through what happened next. Well, Dr. Dr. Arnous, as I say, diagnosed mm -hmm. my problem. Mm -hmm. uh, my swellings and things reduced. Dr. Dr. Cassidy got those down and I was released from the hospital. And uh, so I don't know if you really want to know times, but uh, I had uh, um, Dr. Dr. Arnous had decided that I should have a, a C scan, a CT scan to, to um, decide what he had to do, uh, which I had. And then in January this year, he admitted me to uh, to um, 
to the hospital, the one in Dublin. Yeah. But no, not the one went to the Beacon Hospital. Sorry, sorry, pardon me. And to the Beacon Hospital, and I went up there on the Thursday, and uh, I was prepped on the Thursday evening. And Doctor okay. Arnos operated me on, on, on the Friday afternoon, and uh, I was asleep, of course. And when I when I awoke, I was in a, a bed in a recovery ward in the bed. Um, I was told to lie on my back, stay stay on my back. I had a pad on my right groin, and I had a pacemaker in my left groin. And uh, I had to remain that way for the night. And the okay, next day, I'm then. Gonna... Sorry, sorry, go on. No, you go ahead, James, the next day. Well, the next day, then, when Dr. Arno was visited, um, he decided the pacemaker could go, that uh, I hadn't needed it. And uh, so that was taken out. And that afternoon, I was taken by ambulance back to the critical care unit in, in UHL. And uh, I was there Saturday night and Sunday night, and I was discharged on Monday. And uh, okay. I was able to walk out of the hospital. Really? Yes. And tell me then, what was your recovery like? And apologies, I, I don't know if anyone here, but there's a very annoyed cat in the background of my house who oh, was locked out. So if you're hearing <laughs> cat noises, I do apologize. What, ha what happened then, James? How, how well, was I, I, I had a slight drag in both my groins just for a day or two, mm -hmm. but I was able to walk. And uh, I, as Dr. Arnaud told me to, to exercise gently, very gently for a few weeks, which I did. And uh, I recovered very, very quickly. I couldn't believe it. I thought that I would be semi-invalid semi for at least a couple of months, but not so. Within the week, I, I felt fantastic. Even less than the week, I felt quite amazing. My vigor, I got bigger back and um, I was able to do things that I couldn't do, even think of doing before. And in recovery, did you then realize how much you had been compromised before? Did you yes, I did. Yes, afterwards I did. But prior to that, I really didn't notice, except this swelling and the fact that I couldn't really sleep at night for a, for a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. which was due to the, you know, the retention, fluid retention. OK, so it was a matter of discomfort that you couldn't get to sleep. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. 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 OK. And yeah. um, for anyone listening today, um, what would, would, would there be any message that you would give to them? Yes, take note early of, of, the, of, the, of the breathlessness, especially. Uh, but I didn't. I just thought that I was getting old, really. And uh, I should have, I should have, and the pains across my shoulders, I should have done something sooner. And my wife was very cross with me for not doing it. But uh, finally, when I, when I did do it, it was very well worthwhile. And I should have done it earlier. Okay. Jim, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Anus, we might go to you now. We're seeing that heart valve disease prevalence is rising rapidly. What causes heart valve disease, could I ask? So the causes are many, but as uh, James correctly high highlighted, it's generally um, a disease as we get older, it's a wear and tear, if you like. Uh, so, and it, it happens so slowly that as uh, James was saying, um, you don't think that you're having a problem. You think you're, it's part of aging or you think you're becoming unfit. Um, so most of the time it's a wear and tear aging process. Uh, there are other causes. Some people can be born with a congenital abnormality uh, that increases the risk of, of having a heart valve disease or heart valve problem. And that tends to generally manifest at a younger age. So if you're born with a, with a, with a predisposing condition, um, you tend to have problems at a younger age, but most people, it's just a wear and tear of the valves. Okay. What are the symptoms of heart valve disease? Obviously, Jim has covered some of them there, but watch, you might give us a comprehensive overview of what the symptoms are. So there are many symptoms. Uh, shortness of breath is probably the most common. Okay. Uh, and it's usually a gradual onset shortness of breath, so you'll let, be able to walk less. So if you used to walk you know, five kilometres a day, you can't anymore if you go up hill uh, that you used to uh, be able to you, you uh, slight uh, start noticing a, a general decline you know every week or month it gets less and less so shortness of breath is probably the most common you can get chest pain or chest tightness uh, again usually with exertion and just progressively gets worse uh, you can get dizziness or you know uh, loss of consciousness uh, less likely but also can happen uh, so they're probably the most the three most common symptoms are the symptoms problematic in that people can sometimes put them down to age? 
Yeah, that is the that is the biggest problem, and that's the uh, focus of uh, mm. this week. Really, mm. is um, you know, if if you're having symptoms uh, at any age, really, but certainly over the age of sixty five, mm. if you're having uh, these symptoms, like James highlighted, shortness of breath, uh, it doesn't mean you have heart for heart valve disease, but sure. it, it could mean that, and you should certainly see. It's worth checking it. So yeah, so if somebody does have these symptoms, what do they do? Well, the first thing is to uh, to contact your, your doctor, whether it's your GP or the, the clinic you go to, uh, and and highlight these symptoms and ask the question: Could could it be a problem with my with my heart valves? And uh, you know, a simple test like a, a physical examination and history taken by the by the physician uh, and listening to the heart with a stethoscope can can pick up uh, and detect an abnormality. Um, again, it doesn't necessarily mean if you say if you have a murmur in your heart, it doesn't mean you have a, a serious or a significant heart problem, mm -hmm. but it certainly raises the question, um, and then you get referred to uh, the appropriate center to get other tests like an ECG, like an echo, uh, echocardiogram, and, and see the specialist after that. Can you tell me about a stethoscope check and the importance of that in diagnosing diagnosing this disease, and also whether that is something people need to request that it's not a given that they will get that. Yeah, again, you know, I suppose most doctors would, would do that, but okay. you know, if, if if they don't, do ask the question. Um, mm -hmm. It's an easy, straightforward test. If it takes a few seconds, maybe one or two minutes. Um, and it may be difficult to know what the problem is, but if you can hear something that shouldn't be there, like a heart murmur, at least it sets you in the path to get mm -hmm. uh, checked and get all the tests done. Yeah. So when it's been diagnosed, how serious is valve disease how important is it to treat it early so it's a big spectrum um it depends on the severity uh, of your problem so most of the time if you have uh if we pick say aortic stenosis or narrowing of the aortic valve um it can be mild moderate or severe um and so if you have mild to moderate uh, aortic stenosis uh, you tend to do very well you, you mm -hmm. have uh, most of the time have no symptoms um, and if someone uh, comes up to my clinic and, and they have mild or moderate valvular heart disease, usually uh, don't don't specifically treat them with anything specific, but we monitor them closely. So once a year, once every 12 months, or once every six months, it depends on, on the severity. Mm -hmm. um, but if or when it becomes severe, um, mm -hmm. then firstly, the symptoms start. Um, secondly, the, the, the prognosis generally, again, it depends on what the problem is, but generally the prognosis is not good if you don't, if you don't treat it. Um, and when it comes to that stage, the treatment becomes, you know, um, surgical or you have to replace it. The medical treatment, uh, whilst there are some, isn't very effective in most, in most of these conditions. Okay. So you mentioned treatment there and we've heard from Jim how his life has been restored after his treatment can you talk us through how heart valve disease is treated so if if so if it becomes severe or when it becomes mm -hmm. severe um the generally so we so would focus on aortic valve disease or aortic valve stenosis um, generally the treatment options is, is to put in a new valve again similar to a car it's very hard to to, to fix it you need to put in to put a new system so historically uh, it used to be open heart surgery uh, uh, now there's, you know, uh, medicine has advanced a lot, and as uh, James said, we can do it now through a keyhole procedure, uh, mm -hmm. through the groin for the appropriate patient. So some people, it's, it's still better to do surgery. Uh, okay. And so it depends on the patient, depends on a lot of things that we look into. Uh, but but uh, certainly the treatment options have uh, have advanced hugely in the last 10, 15 years, even even five years. Um, so, so the people who, who weren't able to treat, say, 15, 20 years ago, because they were considered high risk or too frail and so on, we can certainly treat most of them now through uh, a, a less invasive technique, uh, such and as that tab 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 Yeah, yeah. Okay. And c can you tell us, you mentioned it there, but a little bit more explicitly about what TAVI is and also what the implications are for a person's recovery who's had that as opposed to treatments that would have gone before it? So TAVI, as you mentioned, is transcatheter aortic valve implantation. So it's, it's basically keyhole valve replacement. Um, so the advantage is, is it's less invasive. So compared that to surgery where you have to cut open uh, the patient's chest, 
Um, we now do it most of the time under uh, local rather than general anesthetic, so the patients can be awake. Um, the recovery time is much, much quicker. Some patients can go home following day. Um, you know, within two, three days, most, be, most patients go home. Uh, and as James also said, you know, uh, the, the uh, re relief in symptoms is, is almost instant. You know, you get, yeah, you, you, you suddenly can walk much more. Um, and it gets, you know, after a few days, it gets even better and better. So there's, there's, the recovery time is reduced uh, usually, really. And so, again, you've touched on it there, but your experience with patients of how their quality of life improves post-treatment as they go on, what kind of improvements do you see? I, I think it's one of the most rewarding treatments as a cardiologist, really, mm. because, um, you know, a lot of these patients, like James highlighted, uh, the quality of life, affected a lot you know and a lot of the time they're, they're very healthy otherwise you know sure. and, and affect changes you know he was very fit and active he wanted he had a very good quality of life but he was limited by by this one problem um so when you, you improve get rid of it and you see them a few weeks later um it's very rewarding for, for, for the patient and for, for for us as treatment clinici clinicians because you've uh, hugely improved the quality of life so it's you see a more, noticeable difference with with jim yeah it's almost yeah, it's almost immediately, but certainly after a few weeks when you see them in clinic as a follow-up, um, it's, it's, it's great to see it. I imagine it must be really rewarding. What advice would you give to people over 65 or anyone who might have these symptoms who's listening today? I think first thing is uh, don't ignore it. Um, go to your GP. It's not, it's not an emergency. You don't have to go you know, right away, but you know, when, when you're seeing your physician, whether it's your GP or your, or your specialist, mm -hmm. um, you know, ask the question, tell them about your symptoms and, uh, you know, ask them, could it be uh, valvular heart disease? Can, can they listen to your heart with a stethoscope? Okay. I'm going to go to some questions now that have been sent in to us. Um, the first one, um, Dr. Anous, I have plaque in my arteries. I'm fit, always walking and do two HIIT classes a week uh, when I never had high cholesterol, so can't understand where I'm going wrong. Thank you. So this is a very, very different problem. So um, the so the valves, they regulate blood flow uh, from one part of the heart to the other. The arteries are like the say the plumbing system of the of the of the heart. So they uh, supply blood to the heart. So when people have a heart attack, it's due to a blockage in, in the in the artery. Uh, plaque is cholesterol and other things that build up within the artery. Um, the, num the causes are many, so smoking, high cholesterol, diabetes, uh, advanced age, and genetics play, play a big part. So uh, that person was asking the, asking the question when they're saying, I'm doing everything right, but I still have that. It, it could be genetic, uh, but you know, as we all get older, uh, we will all develop a plaque to, to, to some degree or another. So, um, okay. Um, can you develop valve disease if you have heart failure? Um, it's it's the other way around. So heart so valve disease is one of the causes of heart failure. So heart failure is the kind mm. of the uh, end term to a number of things that cause heart failure. So one of the causes is valvular heart disease. Mm. Did you say an ECG would pick it up? Uh, no, but it's one of the an easy it, an easy tool that can pick up an abnormality. But echo, echocardiogram or an ultrasound of the heart is ultimately the the best uh, uh, initial test to do. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Doctor Nuss is talking about treatment of an aortic valve problem. Would that apply to a mitral valve repair too? Yes. So. Uh, as I said, there's four valves, aortic valve is one, mitral valve, uh, yeah. tricuspid valve, and pulmonary valve. So mitral valve is also uh, a common, so aortic and, 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 uh, and the mitral valve are the two most common um, uh, valvular problems that, that we encounter. Okay. I have severe heartburn and trapped wind. Is this a sign of heart problem? Um, generally, no. Um, it, so it depends what causes it. If you're getting it with exertion, um, it can. If you're getting it after eating food, it probably is from your stomach. Uh, but you know, uh, symptoms can vary. So um, I can't answer that. Uh, you know, definitively. Sure. But generally, it generally starts with, if it's a heart problem. Generally starts with exertion, uh, rather than say with food. If you have heartburn after a meal, that's that tends to be your stomach. Do you see a lot of people have put off? 
um, coming to you. And I think that's something we all do with medical things. Just they've they've known there's something wrong, not right, but it's an, almost a block. Anxiety blocks them from coming in. Is that a problem for people? Yeah, so you have two different types of people. There are people who come very, very early um, to make sure they don't have a problem and okay. be proactive. And, and I think that's very good. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a, the other spectrum where people mm -hmm. leave it you know, to, 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 to the very, to the really, really sick. Um, and so we did, we're really trying to discourage that because especially mm -hmm. in my field and, and valvular heart disease, you know, more often than not, there, there is a treatment option. There's a very, good, very good treatment option for most people. And the longer you leave it, um, the, the harder it becomes and the higher the risk. So this, the, the quicker you pick it up, the better your chances of uh, getting a good, successful treatment. Okay. I'm 45 years old and I'm due to get a new aortic valve in the near future due to, due to a bicuspid valve. Please do correct me if I'm getting into the medical pronunciation wrong. What is the current best advice for me, a tissue or a mechanical valve? Uh, there's a few questions here, so I might go with that one first. What is the current best advice, a tissue or a mechanical valve? Which valve will last me longest? And just says I'm a very active person who would like to keep that way post-surgery. What would be my limits with regard to heavy physical activity? So the first part is tissue or a mechanical valve, which will last longer. So bicuspid valve is one of the congenital conditions I, I was mentioning, um, mm. and that is one of the causes of uh, degeneration or stenosis or narrowing of the aortic valve, and it tends to affect people at younger age. So you said you, you the, the current uh, person question is forty five years of age. Um, tissue or mechanic, there's advantages and disadvantages to both. So you have to really discuss this um, thoroughly with your surgeon and your cardiologist. The advantage of a tissue valve is that you do not need long-term um, treatment with blood thinners such as warfarin. So, um, you know, we all know warfarin and, and, and the, the problems you have with being on it. The disadvantage is that they tend to have a, a shorter longevity so they, about 10 to 15 years as opposed to okay. 25 plus years with the with the mechanical valve but also as we are advancing as you know this treatment is advancing really, really year by year uh, in 10 15 years time uh, if you need a, another valve um, you know we already do that so 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 we do we implant valves in a in a, a pre-existing faulty valve so somebody who would have had an operation 10 or 15 years and and now it's renarrowed we can actually put in another new valve within that and that will only advance in the next 10 or 15 years so you know it's there's no real right or wrong answer there's advantages and disadvantages to both um and and it's a it's a, a decision that's made uh by the patient uh, him or herself uh, and and their um treating treating clinician okay thank you next question can you slow down the buildup of calcium around the valve uh, not effectively, so you know, cholesterol tablets and aspirin might, but you know, really, there isn't a huge amount that can be done. Okay, are Fitbit type wearable devices turning many into warriors through measuring metrics night and day? Interesting question. <laughs> yes, <in short. laughs> yes, um, and most of the time, it it overreads. I think these things they overread um, the heart rate. So yes, we've seen, I've seen a lot, certainly of people that are worried because the heart rate goes up. Mm. For no yeah, I'm assuming from what yourself and Jim have said though, that, that getting this treatment does mean when people come out the other side that their ability to exercise is massively improved from what it was. Yes, 100%, I mean, that's the main reason we do it. So we do it mm. for two reasons, quality of life, which is mm. hugely improved in most people and, and people tend to live longer as well because you've gotten rid of the problem. Mm. Do people tend to um, lean into that and kind of feel confident in their new physical self? Or is it something that people can struggle with, you know, relying, knowing this is actually solved and feeling like they can push themselves if they want to? Most people are delighted and said it's very rewarding. And they, a lot of the time they don't believe uh, how much better they are. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of the time they don't realize how bad they were until they get the treatment uh, because mm -hmm. that this is very gradual. Uh, and uh, a lot of people tend to either underplay their symptoms or they just accustom or adjust to it, you know. So instead of walking, you know, uh, two kilometers, they now walk one, one and a half kilometers and then it comes down to one. And they, and they become 
you know, happy with that. Um, and they think it's just part of, you know, part and parcel of it. And then when they have the TAVI or the operation, they realize how limited the quality of life was uh, compared to now. Um, I have a family history of heart valve disease. I'm 57 years old and I was diagnosed with mild heart valve disease at 54. Will my condition deteriorate significantly by the time I'm 65? So he's now 57 and had diagnosis at 54. It depends what the uh, heart valve disease that person has, um, but also every, every person is different. Some people, um, it deteriorates quicker. Other people takes years and decades. Um, so not everyone, it's not the same with everyone. And that's why it's good to be enrolled in a specialist clinic because they can uh, keep an eye on that person every year, sometimes every three years. You know, it doesn't have to be every year. It depends on the severity and the cause of the, of the, of the, of the problem. So, you know, it's best when you have that, it's best to be enrolled in a, in a specialist center because you, you're, you're, you now be looked after uh, every you know, year or two or six months. Okay. And somebody in that condition, in that situation, beyond being monitored, will there be other things that will be applied to their situation, be that ongoing medication or, or lifestyle suggestions that will help to keep things at bay? Or is it just being a case of being monitored? It depends again. Um, sure. So some of the valvular conditions can be uh, aggravated by stuff like high blood pressure. Um, okay. So you know treating that is important uh but a lot of the time there isn't it just uh, you know just degenerates over time okay okay which is why again the early uh reporting symptoms early is so important i suppose i had a tissue aortic valve replacement in 2010 how long do they last um the, the average is about about 15 years but that's mm -hmm. only an average so sure. uh, some could last much longer okay are there medications that help with valve repair? Are there medications that help with valve repair? I don't, hmm. I don't understand the question. I wonder if that's kind of cutting back to what I was saying there a minute ago, if somebody's at the beginning of their, uh, if they've been spotted early, would there be medications that would be, or it's just monitoring really? Sometimes there is. So, so if you've got mitral valve regurgitation or leaking of the mitral valve, uh, it, it can be caused by a condition that affects the heart. So sometimes uh, treating that with tablets and improving the heart function, it can improve that. So it really depends on the, on the valvular condition. But if the primary problem is the valvular condition like aortic stenosis or narrowing the aortic valve, um, there's very little to do from a medical perspective. When would a stent be fitted as opposed to a valve? So a stent is fitted in when there's problems with the artery, so with, with, the, with the plumbing system of the heart, not, not with the valves. So uh, when someone has angina or heart attacks or blockages in the arteries, that's, that's where we put uh, we, we, uh, stents in. This person is asking, I get a weakness down both arms, followed by tightness across chest. Lasts less than a minute. Did any ram but showed nothing. What should I do next, or is it to do with my heart? So if, if, if that... A person had an angiogram and had an echo to to uh, rule out a valvular heart disease. Mm -hmm. and that rules out a lot of the, the, the big things. You know, uh, it, it doesn't mean she doesn't have a problem with the heart, but it, it rules out the, the you know the big things: valvular heart, valvular heart disease, and problems with the arteries of the heart. Okay, thank you. I'm a 30 year old with congenital bi bicuspid aortic stenosis currently at moderate to severe stenosis. I've been keeping very careful with COVID in the UK. Are you generally seeing good or bad case studies with similar congenital, congenital aortic valve patients who are fully vaccinated, including how long COVID may impact the existing valve, valve function? Okay, so we'll go through that again. Are you generally seeing good or bad case studies with similar congenital aortic patients who are fully vaccinated? So we'll look at that first. So in that if they contract COVID, is it? Yes, I think she's asking, including how, well, let's she's looking at how long COVID may impact the existing valve function. So let's go with that first. I, I think long COVID affects everybody, as is my understanding. I've seen a lot of young, healthy people with long COVID. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I don't think having a moderate, severe bicuspid aortic valve increases your risk of long COVID, but we don't know enough about it. But I think, you know, I think I've seen young, healthy people
people who um, have long COVID. So I don't think you need a pre-existing condition. You're on mute. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Next question is, is it likely that open heart surgery will be replaced by minimally invasive surgery in the, new, in the near future? It already is by and large, um, but there's still a role for open heart surgery. They'll pre probably always be a role for open heart surgery because there are some uh, problems um, or some patients that are better served. Even you know today there are some patients better served with open heart surgery, but uh, the majority of, of people now, um, certainly for say aortic, aortic stenosis, uh, getting it through keyhole. Um, it, I don't know if it, it won't ever replace it 100%, but it's certainly more people will be treated with a less invasive uh, in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Okay. Um, thank you for that. This is a long one, so bear with me. My husband died suddenly this year, um, age 56, from a type of thoracic dissection, one centimetre from the aortic valve. Did not say in the autopsy if bicuspid or tricuspid what is the difference and would the type of valve he has cause the thoracic to tear? There was no mention of an aneurysm, so does that mean he had a problem with his heart valve instead? There's a second question, but I'll let you get to that first. Uh, again, it's not necessarily so. Sometimes if you have a bicuspid aortic valve, you can have associated um, problem with the aorta uh, okay. that increase your risk so to, to, for the aorta to be enlarged and increases the risk of dissection. It doesn't mean that if, if uh, someone had a dissection, it doesn't mean that they have a bicuspid aortic valve. Uh, and if they have a bicuspid aortic valve, it doesn't mean that they have a problem with the aorta that increases risk of dissection. So there is a bit of an overlap, but certainly one of the causes, yes. Okay. And she goes on to say, the day goes on to say, my sons have been advised to go for an echo. Why is this? And if they find a problem, can something be done to correct it? So an echo is just an ultrasound of the heart. So it looks at the chambers, looks at the valves. So, it, you know, there are a number of conditions that affect the heart. So if your son is advised, I pre, you know, one of the causes is that is there is a genetic uh, problem uh, mm -hmm. um, and, and they just wanted to get screened, make, uh, yeah, checked and screened that, that, that uh, your son doesn't have it. So it depends really. So you can look at the heart uh, valve, you look at the heart function, you look at the chambers of the heart. So... It's just an ultrasound of the heart. Okay. Um, questions are brilliant, guys. Thank you so much. Keep them coming. I'm on lots of meds for reduced EF. Will any of them prevent valve disease? I don't have HVD now, but is it possible to develop it due to the HF? Uh, yes. So one of the valve problems, like the mitral valve or mitral regurgitation or, mit or leaking of the mitral valve can be caused from uh, reduced EF or reduction in the heart function. So the medications that that person will be on uh, are to improve the heart function uh, and as a, as a secondary effect reduces the chances of having a, 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 a mitral, particularly mitral heart problem or tricuspid heart problem. So it can, yes. Okay. Um, myocarditis can be linked with COVID. Can myocarditis impact valve function or is it just heart inflammation that can be solved by medication? Uh, it's, the, it's the latter, so it's uh, heart inflammation, yes, it doesn't usually impact the uh, valve function. Okay. I have been told I have a slightly large heart and I'm on statins and high blood pressure tablets, but I find if my grandson puts any pressure on my chest, I can feel pressure on my heart. Is this a sign of serious trouble ahead? So as in physical pressure on the chest? I'm assuming so, yeah. Uh, no, it shouldn't be, no. Okay. It's not a sign of serious trouble ahead. Okay. Um, I have an extensive radiotherapy. I've ha have had extensive radiotherapy, excuse me. And because of this, I have to take calcium tablets every day. I'm starting to get tightness in my chest during exercise. Is there a possibility that I have excessive calcium in my arter arterial system? Thank you for your advice. Yes, um, it is a possibility. So uh, chest tightness with exertion is one of the common uh, symptoms of um, problems in the arteries of the heart or in the valves of the heart. So okay. I think that, that person needs to get checked, yes. So would their first step be GP? Uh, GP or uh, if they're already enrolled in a, in a cardiac clinic to, to go to that, but GP would be the first step, yes. Okay. Would high cholesterol cause deterioration of the heart valves? Uh, 
yes, indirectly, um, it does. Um, so. Okay. So that is something people would even out. I see a lot of arterial fibrillation devices on offer on social media. Are they recommended? And if so, which one would re would you recommend for use at home? I think the, I suppose any device is good. Um, the problem is, as you said earlier, it can it it, can, it usually picks up a problem when there isn't a problem. But sure. if you have if you have um, a device that or if you have a, a if concern that you might have atrial fibrillation, having a device that detects your heart rate um, is, is good, is advisable, yes. Okay. Is plaque dangerous or can it be treated? I'm 58, also I have narrowing of the artery at one side. Is this serious? So two there. Uh, so pl plaque in the coronary arteries uh, needs to be treated, um, mm -hmm. usually just with medications like uh, statins or cholesterol tablets. Mm -hmm. um, it depends then on the severity. If it's causing symptoms like angina, mm -hmm. uh, then they, they can be treated with stents or bypass. Mm -hmm. um, so it depends again. But yes, once you have plaque, uh, you, most people need to be on medications, at least such as statins. Okay. And narrowing of the artery at one side, is this serious? So narrowing is caused by plaque. Um, so okay. it depends on, so there's mild, moderate and severe. So it, it, it's, if it's mild or moderate, it usually causes no symptoms. So usually treatment is with medications such as statins and maybe aspirin. It depends on the extent of it. If it's severe, it usually causes obstruction to blood flow. So people would have symptoms like chest pain when they were with exertion or breathlessness with exertion. And then the, the, in, in that condition um, or that scenario, they can be treated with uh, stents to open up the artery or bypass operation, it depends again on the location and severity. Okay. Uh, we've just gone through 18 months of the COVID pandemic. Have you noticed that people are later going to get checked if they feel symptoms? What is the impact and what is your advice? Really good question. Uh, initially we did. So uh, during the first lockdown, we had, um, after the first lockdown, we had a lot of people that came in um, sicker than we were, were, were used to, uh, whether, they, whether to clinics or to the hospital. And uh, I think people were kind of uh, sitting on their symptoms longer and people were afraid to come in to hospital in case they contracted COVID-19. Uh, thankfully, it's not, that's not a big problem anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, due to a number of reasons, uh, obviously you, you can sit on your symptoms for so long, but, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, awareness campaigns to to let people know that this is uh, it's safe to come into hospital if, uh, if you have a, if you have a, a concern um, and it's safe to come into to be to go to your gp or be referred to to a clinic in hospital so um I, thankfully we don't see it anymore as much but certainly at the, at the start of the pandemic um it was a major concern i think that is all our questions and um, I might just ask you, Dr. Anderson, thank you so much for answering them so extensively. If there, would any, if there was any key message that you would like to communicate, and when we've talked about how this is common and serious, but treat, treatable, especially if caught early, what would the key messages you would like to give to people tonight who are listening? So the key message is um, early detection in conditions such as valvular heart disease is important. Uh, mm -hmm. It's important because um, it allows uh, treatment to be initiated early if indicated um, and improves the chances of success. Um, so if you have a symptom, um, if, if you're any age, but certainly if you're over the age of 65, if it's symptoms such as shortness of breath or chest pain, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a valvular problem uh, or a heart problem, but it may. So uh, it, I think you should get checked. You should go to your GP or doctor, ask them to examine you. Uh, with a stethoscope, I started to uh, assess your symptoms um, and then be referred appropriately. And most of the time, valvular heart uh, disease is uh, not a serious problem in that it can be monitored. It doesn't, it doesn't mean you have any surgery or an intervention straight away, uh, but it, it means you're enrolled in that specialist clinic and you can be monitored over time. And if or when the time comes that you require treatment, uh, this would be given or uh, uh, offered to, to, to the patient uh, uh, sooner uh, and therefore imp improve, improves the chances of success uh, and improves their quality of life uh, and quantity of life. Dr. Rings, thank you so much for answering all those questions. Jim, I might go back to you if that's okay. And thank you so yes. much for your patience. 
for anyone who's listening, and we just touched upon it there earlier, who might be might be in the position of suspecting something's wrong, but having that kind of anxiety of almost putting the head in the sand, could you give us a little bit of a sense of, you know, what if there was anxiety in your case and what a difference it has made? You know, you powered through, you you got the treatment, and and how worth it it is to do that for anyone who might be feeling a little bit worried. Well, no, I don't. I don't think I, I felt anxiety. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, but I did want to be cured. Mm. I didn't. Uh, I didn't want to continue this way, if, if at all possible. Mm. And uh, the treatment that Doctor Andrews gave me uh, gave me a new lease of life. Mm. And I'm so delighted that I got it. Mm. And I'm so delighted that I recovered so quickly. I couldn't believe that. I thought it was a miracle, to be quite honest. But uh, I must thank my my own doctor, Doctor Liam Casserly, for referring me to Doctor Andrews because. Uh, he, he knew exactly what he was doing too. So and he, has kept me, for anyone. Yeah, he yeah. has kept me alive for the last 10 years. I have had renal problems, uh, but he has been my rock. And Jim, I might just ask you, after your successful treatment, what is there or is there an activity or event that you're most excited about getting back to that might have not been possible for you before you had the treatment? Oh, I want to back on my bike. Really? <laughs> yes, both, both cycle and motorcycle. When, had, when yes. were you last on a bike before the treatment? Well, it was, it was over a year. It was, well, I had continued with the motorcycle, but I was finding it difficult to take it out of the garage. It was, it was heavy, you see, but uh, I hadn't been on the push bike for about 18 months before that. Okay. So. And can I ask just lastly, Jim, and then Dr. Arnus, if I can um, go back to you, because we've actually had a few more questions coming in, if you don't mind, just give us a little bit more of your time. But Jim, how has the treatment positive, to, positively impacted on your family life? Well, karma's a lot more easy with me now, and uh, I can do an awful lot. As a matter of fact, she said the other day that she was going to go to Dr. Arnold's to try and keep up with me. <laughs> so, <laughs> better, I think she's better off going to Dr. Cassidy, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> no, she'll go directly to you. <laughs> That's a great ad. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Jim. Dr. Arnuz, I might just go back to you if you, if you don't mind. Um, another question here. Heart valve disease is a condition of ageing. Uh, how important is it for family members to be aware and ensure their parents and grandparents are aware of symptoms and the action that they need to take? I think that's younger very, members do. Yeah, it's very important. This is the take home message is uh, awareness. You know, just go and get checked. It's easy to get checked. It's a very easy, non-invasive test that can be done. The clinical examination first and then uh, an echo scan if required. And uh, it's just simple tests that can determine if there's a problem. Hmm. And, and it can make a difference, I would imagine, if other family members are aware of what the symptoms are and um will kind of gently um, move people along. I know I do it with my own father to, to, to take, make that visit. What happens when the GP listens to your heart? What is a heart murmur? So a heart murmur is a, a turbulent or a abnormal flow. So if it's just a general term, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a problem. There's a number of reasons why you might have a heart murmur, mm-hmm. but it can, it, it means, it can mean there's a, a problem or an abnormality in the valve, either it's narrowed or leaking, and then you hear what you hear is turbulent flow that shouldn't be there. Um, so that's the first sign you hear, and then you get referred appropriately after that. Okay, uh, two more, if that's okay. How common is it to need a pacemaker after valve replacement? It's about five to ten percent. Okay, so very low. Yeah, it's too high. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. It's it's improving with the technology. Is it so? Has the TAVI procedure lowered that? Yeah, it certainly. I mean, it started at twenty twenty five percent. You know, wow. say 10, 15 years ago, it's down. It depends on the valve and on the patient. It's down to generally five to ten percent, and it'll continue to improve. I think with time. Okay. I want to know about moderate valve disease and what treatment recommended if only shortness of breath. If the shortness of breath is mild. So shortness of breath can be, it does, it can be caused by a number of reasons. It doesn't necessarily mean, so if you have moderate valve disease and you are breathless, it does not necessarily mean that the valve is causing the breathlessness. And generally speaking, if, you, if it's truly moderate valve disease, it shouldn't cause you breathlessness. Um, so it's either severe or you have another reason to be breathless. This might be crossing over slightly. What's the treatment for moderate leaking valve and how often would you need to check it out? 
most of the time it's uh, medical treatment or treat the cause if there is a cause um, okay. uh, and most of the time it's just uh, observing and and echoing every so often and um, assessing okay. the patient every so often okay what is a t t e e and is it dangerous t e e hmm. trans esophageal echo it's the uh, yeah it's must be, I think. We okay. say T O D O E in America is T E E. It's just an echo scan, I think, unless it's something else. Okay. And um, if you had an anagram done a few years ago just to check it out, I have a heart murmur and history of heart disease in the family. Should I should I do it again? So I repeat the question again. Sorry. If you had an anagram done a few years ago just to check it out, I'm assuming there was nothing came up, but I have a heart murmur and a history of heart disease in the family. Should I do an anagram again? Oh, an angiogram, is it? Sorry, excuse me, an angiogram. So an angiogram is different from an echo. An angiogram looks at the arteries. It's a little bit more invasive. Mm. Uh, uh, so the two separate questions there. So if, if, the, if there's a heart murmur and a valvular problem, Again, it depends on what it is. Um, mm. you, the, the specialist would advise whether that person needs a, a yearly echo, five yearly echo, or, or okay. a 10 yearly echo, or six monthly echo. The angiogram looks at the arteries of the heart. So again, it depends if it's normal. It really depends, you know, if it's normal, you usually don't need a repeat one unless, uh, you know, you have symptoms or, or other conditions that might, um, you know, uh, cause narrowing over time. So. Okay. I was wondering if a ha ha heart valve repair, excuse me, using a catheter through the groin was done in Dublin or is open heart surgery the only option in Dublin, I assume? No, in Dublin, so it's available. Tabby is available uh, okay. in, in the major centres in Dublin. So, okay. and both, both surgery and Tabby are available in Dublin. Okay. Recently, I feel like normal tasks feel like a bigger ordeal, like climbing the stairs. Sometimes I feel dizzy. Should I get checked for heart valve? disease yes in short yes yeah i think that's our key message tonight mm -hmm. isn't it? any of those symptoms how important is it to keep a track of your symptoms and changes with virtual appointments more frequent these days sometimes i find it difficult to remember everything i think it's important to keep track you know uh, you know you, you need to get checked once a year um with, with your gp um and and you know if you if you didn't have a valvular problem now it doesn't mean you won't have it in, in a year or two or three so i think uh, annual checkups are important um, we have a question for jim and yes. um, jim people want to know what kind of motorbike you have <laughs> <laughs> i have a honda cbr 650f okay and it is one it is 18 months old it's the first new bike i ever had all my other bikes were second hand or put together by myself its value has gone up tenfold now at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> and it's silver in colour. <laughs> and you've been, have you been out on it yet or is that? I was out this morning at seven o'clock on it. Fantastic. I'm out every morning on it. Oh, brilliant. Um, Dr. Anus, another question for you. About 18 months ago, I had an echocardiogram and I had another this year and was told had gone from 20 to 50. So I think the word used was gradient. I was also told that next year, if it goes to 70, I will need a new valve. I walk about eight kilometers a day with no ill effects. So, so that, that, sound, that sounds like aortic stenosis. Um, so if it's 50, it's, if it's the peak gradient, it's in the moderate range. So it's, it's progressing. So if it goes up to 70, then it's usually, it means it's in the, 70, in this, in the severe range. And if, she, if that person is symptomatic and they have severe uh, aortic stenosis, then generally would be to, to uh, replace it either by surgery or tabby. Okay. And Jim, we have a comment from somebody. Nice bike, Jim. Can't wait to get on my own. <laughs> I think that is us done, unless anyone else has any last minute questions. You've both been incredibly patient and informative. I'm really grateful to you both. Um, so thank you so much to our speakers and to everyone on the line for joining us and for all the questions coming in. I'm sorry. <laughs> Somebody said, it's obvious that Leah's cat got nervous when it heard the term cat scan. She is actually on anxiety medication, so that is quite possible. <laughs> But luckily, she's taken herself off. Um, sorry, one last question. Low resting heartbeat in mid to low 50s. Is it cause for concern worth reducing BP meds? 
Um, if asymptomatic, usually not. Um, so the causes are many. So if you're if you're very fit, you can have a low resting heart rate. If you're on uh, heart medications like beta blockers, they can reduce your heart rate. Um, so if you're asymptomatic and it's 50s, usually it's not a concern, and we don't we don't uh, treat that. Okay, great. I hope everyone feels they've benefited from this uh, webinar as part of the Heart Valve Disease Awareness Week. Um, thank you so much for all your questions. If we didn't get to anything, or if there's anything that you think about later, uh, you can always contact the Cree Health team for more information. And I think the guys will be putting up a slide now with all the information. You will receive a post-event survey, so please share your feedback. And you'll also receive a link to the recording of this um, session so you can watch back over it. Um, and I think as our two speakers have so um, eloquently made the point, don't forget heart valve disease is common, serious, but treat treatable. And if you're over 65, ask your doctor for a stethoscope and check at least once a year. So thank you both so much and over to you, Annie. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Sorry, I was talking to myself there for a moment. Apologies, I'll start again. Um, thank you, Leah, and thank you to our panelists um, for this evening, uh, for the very, very, very um, informative webinar. Um, and thank you to you, our audience, for asking so many questions. Um, I just wanted to let you know about our HeartLink West helpline. It's a free helpline, uh, which is offered by um, Cree. It is operational every weekday from Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 5.30. If you call 091-544-310 or email healthteam at cree.ie, you will get to speak with um, Maeve, our cardiovascular nurse specialist, and the wider health team of community dietitians, physical activity specialists, and health psychologists. Um, if you have any concerns on foot of the webinar this evening, or indeed any questions about your heart health, please do give us a call. You may also be interested in joining our weekly virtual chats. Um, they happen every Thursday at 11 o'clock via Zoom, where you join um, to meet a member of our health team. It may be Maeve, it may be um, Ashling, our dietitian, chatting about um, heart health in relation to your diet, cholesterol, blood pressure, um, stress, very various topics, a different topic every week. That's in a Zoom format, so you can come on and ask your questions directly of the team. We have a webinar coming up um, with me now. So we have a webinar coming up on the 30th of September to mark World Heart Day, which is actually on the 29th, but the webinar is taking place on September 30th. Uh, this is a heart to heart with the Cree Health team. So if you would like to discover a little bit more about what your risk might be in terms of developing heart disease or stroke, then join the Cree Health team for an interactive session on that evening to start your journey towards heart health. You can register um, for that webinar via our website on www.cree.ie. You can also check out our website for any um, other information with regard to events, heart health events and resources that we have um, with regard to, to various heart conditions and action that you can take in that regard. And that's it. And thank you very much for joining. And we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar. Take care. Thank you very much.